Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Tanisha Fazal. She is a professor of political science at the University of Minnesota. Her research and teaching focus on sovereignty, international law, medical care in conflict zones, and armed conflict. From 2021 to 2023, she is also an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, and she is the author of State Death and the book we're going to talk about today, Wars of Law, Unintended Consequences in the Regulation of Armed Conflict. So, Dr. Fazal, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so, I mean, let's start perhaps with a basic question. What are laws of war? So you can think about the, or the law, the term laws of war is often used to describe two main bodies of international law. The first is what's called in Latin, um, the use ad bellum. And this is the laws of war governing the resort to force. So is it legal for, or would it be legal for uh, Russia to invade Ukraine, for example? Um, the second body of laws of war, and that's the body that I really focus more on in my book, is what's called the use in bello. And these are the laws of war that govern belligerent conduct once they're actually engaged in a conflict. So this is the body of law that um, describes how it is that you're supposed to treat prisoners of war, the wounded, uh, civilians, etc. Mm -hmm. And how far back in history do we have to go to find these laws of war? I mean, when did they start appearing exactly? Well, that's a, it kind of depends on what you mean by finding and appearing uh, in yeah. this case, because there have been, you know, there are a lot of people who make the argument that the laws of war, and in here really I'm talking about the laws of war governing belligerent conduct in conflict, uh, are driven by norms of reciprocity. Uh, and that would suggest that you've seen these laws for a long time, that they've been around in one form or another for a long time, but they weren't codified in multilateral treaties until the mid to late 19th century. Mm -hmm. What about uh, declarations of war and peace treaties specifically? Do those, do those go far back in history or not? They do. Um, declarations of war have been around probably since at least ancient Greece. Um, and peace treaties, uh, the first known peace treaty is from ancient Egyptian times. Mm -hmm. And are there trends across history in terms of uh, how people declare war, what kinds of war people use declarations of war for, and peace treaties as well? Yes. Um, so I think the, the most remarkable trend is that since the end of World War II in particular, we've seen a real decline in the use of declarations of war and also peace treaties in the context of interstate war, wars between states. So declaring war, for example, and signing a peace treaty, these have been norms of this is what you do, this is what war looks like, and this was how people oftentimes marked the beginning and ends of war, not just participants in the war, but also observers of war. Um, and these have kind of gone by the wayside. But uh, we see some different trends when we're looking at for example, civil wars, wars within states. In particular, we see a real increase in the use of peace treaties in civil war, um, especially since the end of the Cold War, but you know, even generally, I would say, since the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. So are there major differences in terms of how people declare war and how they sign peace treaties uh, across different types of war, like, for example, interstate civil wars and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think that you, it's hard to answer that question without going into the why of um, the major differences as well. So I would say that with both declaring war and signing peace treaties, but especially, I think, in some ways, when it comes to the declarations of war, part of the implication of issuing a de declaration of war is that you recognize 
the legitimacy of your belligerent on the interna international legal stage. And I think that's part of why we don't see states in particular issuing declarations of war against rebel groups because they don't want to legitimize these challengers to their authority. When we, we do see, as I noted, this increase in the use of peace treaties in the context of civil war, but this is usually because there's some third party oftentimes, you know, say a mediator from the United Nations or some other non-governmental organization or a third party state um, that's really pushing the use of peace treaties. Mm -hmm. What were some of the major laws of war introduced during the 20th century? So the some of the major laws of the I think the set of laws of war that we most often associate with use in Bellow are the 1949 Geneva Conventions, of course, um, which deal with issues like treatment of the sick and wounded, uh, treatment of prisoners of war, treatment of occupied populations. Some would argue that the 1977 additional protocols common to the 1949 Geneva Convention, sorry for all the, the legal legalese here, the technical... No, language. you can use it <laughs> as you will, so no problem. Um, so there's sort of a 1977 update uh, or amendment, set of amendments to the 1949 Geneva Conventions, and these um, are important for a couple reasons. One is that they start to introduce more clearly a definition of what a civilian is. Uh, you know, people assume that the 1949 Geneva Conventions are all about civilian protection. That's actually not the focus of those conventions. You see this shifting much more once you get to the 77 uh, additional protocols. Uh, and they start to be a little bit more focused on civil wars, which makes sense because there's a real increase in civil wars after, uh, after 1945, especially relative to interstate wars. And then I would also say that another um, really important set of, or one law that has a lot of implications was the, the Rome Statute creating the International Criminal Court. So actually providing some accountability uh, in a clear way for violations of certain laws of war, although you know the Rome Statute also is somewhat controversial because it provides for individual criminal liability, not state liability. Mm -hmm. What objectives do people have in mind whenever they create new laws of war? I mean, perhaps we would have to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis, but are there any general goals people tend to have in mind? I think, you know, I think that a lot of times people are really trying to mitigate the human costs of war. They're really trying to, especially today, limit the costs of war um, for people, for, and especially for civilian populations. But, I, you know, if you go back a little bit farther, you, would, you could make the argument that part of the incentive to create laws of war, specific laws of war, was to limit the effect on, um, on military populations. For example, you know, some of the earlier laws of war about the use of chemical warfare or certain kinds of weapons that civilians probably weren't going to be victimized by, but military personnel were. But I will say that it's, I think one of the really interesting things about looking at the history of the laws of war is that you tend to see new laws of war emerging after wars after specific wars. And there is a little bit of fighting the last war um, in this with, you know, legally speaking, in the sense that you're trying to address the issues um, when it comes to some of the human costs of war that occurred in the last war, but these might not be the same issues that emerge in the next war. Mm -hmm. So it's basically, I mean, people go through a war and they notice there are some new emergent issues and perhaps they reflect on that and that's when they develop new laws to prevent certain new problems. Possibly. Precisely. So, for example, in the interwar period between the world wars, you saw laws of war regarding um, the use of chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. So think about, you know, the kind of the mustard gas, the gas warfare that occurred in World War One. This wasn't, you know, chemical weapons weren't necessarily 
military it, they weren't they weren't used in World War II, but I'm not sure that it's because of that law. It might have been because they um, they weren't as militarily useful or deemed as militarily useful in World War II, which is from a military perspective a different very different kind of set of campaigns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that in mind, do laws of war work? I mean, do they fulfill their purposes? Um, so there's real variation in compliance with international, I should say another, another term for the laws, the kinds of laws of war we're talking about is international humanitarian law. And I would say that there's real variation in terms of compliance with international humanitarian law. Uh, you know, some have argued that democracy is fighting other states that have also ratified the laws of war are especially likely to comply because you know that the other side has an obligation to comply. Um, you know, but again, I think it, it's, it's really hard to pin down. And one of the arguments that I make in my book is that one of the things that states have done in response to changes, and it's especially you know, when we talk about the trajectory of the laws of war, one thing you really have to notice is that there are many more laws of war on the books today than there were in the past. I mean, there's really been a proliferation in terms of codified laws of war. And so this places a lot of obligations on states. And I think that states have responded by trying to limit their legal liability. So going back to what we were saying earlier about trends in declarations of war and peace treaties, I think this is one of the ways that they've done that is they're not engaging with the formalities of war anymore with declarations of war or peace treaties because they want to create a little bit as much of a legal gray zone as they can uh, in term to uh, with regard to the applicability of the laws of war to them in their conflicts. Mm -hmm. Have laws of war influenced in any way rates of war initiation since World War II? I don't think so. Um, I, I well, I mean, I think if you think, not in terms of, I would not say that international humanitarian law has, um, but I, it is possible that the use ad bellum, uh, so for example, you know, the UN charter uh, saying that you're not allowed to uh, attack the political uh, independence or territorial sovereignty of a member state, I think has changed the way that states go about conducting their business. Um, so for example, you tend not to see, uh, I mean, we'll see what happens. We're, we're recording this right now in, in early, mid February, right, 2022, and everybody is wondering what is going to happen with respect to Russia and Ukraine. So we'll mm -hmm. see what happens there, but we really haven't seen much in the way of wholesale um, conquests of other states where one state just completely absorbs another state um, uh, since the creation of the United Nations and the United Nations Charter. So I think that, that set of laws of war has potentially had a big effect. But I will also say, uh, and here I'm actually going back more to my first book than to the book that, that we've been talking about, that what we have seen uh, instead of states absorbing physically other states is a real shift to uh, interventions to replace regimes and leaders. So if you think about, I, I often think about this, these, some of these changes like a balloon, where if you have a balloon and it has a certain amount of air and you squeeze it a little bit, not enough to make it pop, but just a little bit, the air goes from one side to another. So certain options are, are foreclosed for states, so they turn to other tools to meet their same political ends. Mm -hmm. uh, are military interventions that are presented as humanitarian police actions, counterinsurgencies, or counterterrorism, in fact, wars or not? Well, I think it depends on what your criteria for war are. <laughs> um, some people look to who the participants are in a war, um, how many battle fatalities there are, whether the dispute is over politics and also the legal status of belligerents. And so I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to this question. There are some, uh, for example, there are some data sets out there 
that would code certain police actions. So the Korean War was famously called a police action, um, but I would certainly call that a war. Um, the war in Afghanistan uh, that the U.S. you know where the U.S. just withdrew, I would also call a war. Do you want to call um, what has been going on in a lot of Central American states domestically with respect to the rise of criminal gangs where there are a lot of fatalities and there are organized armed groups, is that a war? Uh, you know, it's not, uh, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think for me one question I would want answered is what the political motives or whether there are political motives um, involved uh, on the part of the main actors and are, is it just criminal gangs, not just, but is, is it the case that it's criminal gangs terrorizing local populations, in which case it's very one-sided, uh, or is, it, is there actually another military on the other side of that kind of conflict? Mm -hmm. So uh, who exactly are the framers of international humanitarian law? Uh, so this is something that has changed over time. Historically, it was a mix of mostly statesmen, and I do mean men, um, from Europe, uh, including military personnel. Uh, today, I think we see more in the way of international lawyers, representatives from non-governmental organizations. The International Committee of the Red Cross, for example, has always been a central player, and they really see themselves as, as the custodians of the laws of war, which has some interesting implications for how they operate as an organization. But I do think that today we see fewer military personnel directly involved um, in framing the laws of war. Uh, there's some very interesting um, recent work that's been looking at the role of non-European states in framing international humanitarian law as well. Mm -hmm. um, are these laws biased in any way? Um, well, I think that they're certainly biased in the sense that they are biased toward states. Um, you know, international law in order to be a party to international law, you have to be a state, right? Um, that's what international law is. It's built upon this foundation of sovereignty and recognition of sovereignty. And so laws were made by states for states. Um, and the application of international humanitarian law, uh, I mean, some would disagree, but my position is that the application, if you just read the letter of the law of, of this body of law to rebel groups is oftentimes vague, certainly historically, and I think even today, for a reason, which is that states don't want to legitimize uh, rebel groups. Uh, and so I think that, that that is definitely one of the biases uh, in international humanitarian law. Mm -hmm. um, so in the book, you also talk about the incentives that international humanitarian law creates. So are so, what are these incentives and are some of them perverse? Yes. So as I was saying before, I think that one of the consequences of the proliferation of international humanitarian law, which, you know, as we should say, as we should say, and goes back to your question of who the framers of international humanitarian law are, you know, I think the people who drafted and worked very hard to generate this body of international law had very good intentions. Right. So I'm not at all casting aspersion on their motives. But I do think that by having this proliferation of the laws of war, um, states have wanted to li limit their own legal liability. Uh, and so as a consequence, as I mentioned earlier, they don't engage in the formalities of war, like declarations of war and peace treaties anymore, especially in their wars were, uh, with each other, so that they can make an argument that they're not necessarily bound by international humanitarian law. And I do think that that is a perverse um, set of incentives because certainly the framers of international humanitarian law did not draft this body of law with the intention or even expectation that states would try to sidestep the laws. Mm -hmm. Are there any cases or any possibility for rebel groups to engage with international humanitarian law? Yes, there are. Um, I would point out two instances here. Uh, first, um, and this is an argument I make in the book, I, I find that secessionist groups 
groups that want to have their own independent, internationally recognized state are especially likely to want to engage with international humanitarian law. And this goes back to your question about the biases in international humanitarian law and really international law more broadly, which is that it applies to states. And so these are groups that want to be states. And so there's a, you know, they, they, they want to send this signal to the club, the existing club of states that if they are to be let into the club, that they will be good and capable members of that club, of that community. And one way to do this is by not only complying with international humanitarian law, which demonstrates a certain baseline capability, but also by broadcasting that compliance, oftentimes in contrast to the states that they're fighting um, who might be violating international humanitarian law. So that's one general set of patterns. Um, and then another is that there are certain NGOs, um, and there's, a, there's an NGO called Geneva Call, which I think is a really good example of this, uh, based, not surprisingly given the name, in Switzerland, whose um, approach is specifically to engage rebel groups, or in the, in the language of international law, and in the language that um, the Geneva Call uses, if I'm remembering correctly, armed non-state actors. Uh, and so unlike, say, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is um, very committed to the state-based international legal order, so the International Committee of the Red Cross won't go into a state, typically, unless they have some sort of agreement or consent from the central government. Geneva Call, on the other hand, will try and engage rebel groups directly. Uh, and they do so with the purpose of trying to train them in international humanitarian law and actually get them to commit to abide by international humanitarian law. So these rebel groups are not legally eligible to sign on to the 1949 Geneva Conventions or the additional protocols, but they can and have and do sign these what are called deeds of commitment that um, that Geneva Call has created that they can sign on to. Mm -hmm. What about uh, non-secessionist rebels? I mean, are there differences in behavior between the secessionists and the non-secessionist rebels? There are definitely differences in behavior. In general, secessionists are, for example, much less likely to target civilians compared to non-secessionist rebels. And I would say that there are two main reasons for this. One is actually a, just a military strategic reason, which is that secessionists tend to be geographically contained, right? They have a particular territory that they're trying to control and have be their new state. And so this, the civilians that are most within their reach, who they could target, um, a lot of them are the population of this new state that they want to create. Now, secessionists aren't perfect when it comes to compliance with international humanitarian law because they do target non-co-ethnics, um, so people who they who live in that area who they don't actually want to be part of the new state, so that, that certainly does happen. The other po civilian population that secessionists could target are people who live over the putative border, um, so people who live in the state that, that, they, that they want to secede from, but they know that because the the state knows where they are and they are so geographically concentrated that they'd be very vulnerable to a counterattack. So that's the military reason. And then the political reason is the one that I outlined earlier, which is that um, they, secessionists believe oftentimes, and not necessarily correctly, but they believe that if they behave well, that there will be some rewards for that good behavior. Um, and in particular, they're looking for the reward of being admitted to the club of states. Mm -hmm. When it comes to civil wars, what explains the fact that the percentage of them that have been concluded with peace treaties has increased over time? I think that um, the main explanation for this, the one that I find uh, most persuasive, is that there has been rightly increased international interest in civil wars. Um, and that interest um, 
is mostly coming, you know, it's partly a function of the fact that there are so many more civil wars today than there were in the past. Um, but it is, it is uh, an interest that comes from uh, organizations like the United Nations, uh, sort of similar like-minded non-governmental organizations. And, and again, I, I really applaud their commitment to trying to end war. Um, they, uh, you know, and, and as part of that commitment, they have um, really developed a, a lot of skills when it comes to mediation. Uh, and so they have developed, I think, I, I think what I would call the international community um, has developed a real taste for mediation. And so there's a cadre of people who are trained as mediators and they are sent to help conclude these wars. And part of their model oftentimes includes a peace treaty. And so I think that, that, that there, there is this model out there for how you conclude wars and it tends to include a peace treaty. Mm -hmm. Uh, in what ways do you think that the belligerents' relationship to laws of war might influence their trajectory in the future? Um, you mean the, the trajectory of the laws or the... Uh, yeah, the, the laws, yes. Um, so I don't think that there... I, I'm not so sure that we're going to see much of an influence. I think we're kind of seeing a pretty similar pattern play out at least right now. Uh, and I think it's very interesting in the context of cyber, for example, where there, there have been some efforts to kind of get ahead of the curve a little bit with respect to cyber to develop. There isn't an international agreement necessarily, but there, there's something, you know, there are some legal groups that are trying to develop essentially codes of conduct. Um, but this, you know, we were saying earlier um, that the oftentimes the laws are kind of responding to the last war. And I think you see that in a slightly different, something similar, but a little bit different in the context of cyber. And then, you know, it'd be really interesting to see how this plays out when in, in you know, with respect to issues like uh, artificial intelligence. But the issue here is that the technology is moving so quickly that I don't know that there's time to develop laws in the way that they have been developed before with conferences and ratifications, etc., cetera, um, before the law becomes outdated. Mm -hmm. And do you think that people different from the current framers of uh, international humanitarian law should be included in future lawmaking efforts? Um, so I think that it would I, th I think that it, it, so I think that you should definitely include the military more, although it's a controversial opinion because mm -hmm. you know, the laws are meant to limit the military, right? Um, and the, it's just a question of how pragmatic do you want to be and sort of how on that spectrum of like idealism versus not believing in the law at all and somewhere in the middle, which is where I sit. Um, where do you want to sit? But if, you know, my position is that I think you should probably be looping in the military more. And I do think that you're seeing that more when it comes to, for example, AI. Um, I think that it could make sense actually to include some representatives of um, either current or more likely former rebel groups in some of these conferences. They have participated in some ways, uh, in limited ways, in past conferences. But if you think that, and, you know, it's sort of uh, the future is always a little bit unclear, and a lot of people believe that we return, we're going to return to an era of major power war. Um, if you think though that the rate of civil wars is going to stay about the same, um, then I think it could make sense to get more buy-in. Um, from, from groups uh, you know, to get a sense of how the wars play out and what are the obstacles to compliance um, from different groups and, and to, to rethink some of the international legal constraints, just the system as a whole, uh, when it comes to these laws of war. I think one other group that I would mention is that, um, that you know, there's been some research that shows that 
most civil wars, so as I said before, most wars today are civil wars. There's been some research that shows that most civil wars today occur in Muslim majority countries. Um, and there is um, a tradition of Islamic humanitarian law. And so I think that another group that you might want to give a more prominent place to at the table are um, Islamic jurists in particular. Uh, because when you look at lists of who ratifies different humanitarian law treaties, there are off, there's another column for what are called reservations, understandings, and declarations. So this is, you know, I agree to this except for this piece. So little carve outs essentially. And it's, it's pretty common that you see Muslim majority states registering these reservations in particular. So, you know, for example, when it comes to laws about child soldiering, where the age of adulthood um, in, I think, Portugal, uh, where you are, and certainly in the US where I am, is, is 18. But in the Islamic world, it could be 15. And so for them, somebody who is uh, 16 or 17 maybe shouldn't count as a child soldier. And so, I, and I think, you know, take, having, having that conversation um, more explicitly and carefully um, could be helpful in terms of developing a body of international humanitarian law that works better for the parties that are currently engaged in the conflicts where that body of law is supposed to apply. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier, we talked about perversive incentives or perverse incentives. Sorry. Do you know of any specific ways that we could change our current laws of war that would reduce or remove these perverse incentives? I think that's really hard to do. Um, uh, you know, that's something I've, I've given a lot of thought to. I mean, I do think that having these different broadening who's at the table um, as we were just talking about, I think can help um, to some extent, but um, uh, I'm not, I, I think it's very, very hard to, to change the system much beyond that because of the state-based nature of, of international law. Mm -hmm. So talking about trends of war, have inter interstate wars really been on the decline as some prominent people like Steven Pinker and other proponents of the decline of war thesis uh, say? Um, so this is, this is one of my, this is a topic I've actually spent a lot of time thinking <laughs> about. Um, I think that the decline of war is overstated. Um, okay. And it's not because of international law. It's because of the ways that we count wars. So Pinker, for example, the empirical basis for his claim that war is on the decline is a decline in battle fatalities, battle deaths. Um, and, you know, in some ways you can't blame him for making, using that as an empirical basis because all the, pretty much all the data sets that we have on, um, wars, counting what counts as a war, have a fatality threshold. You have to have X number of people, um, and sometimes it's military personnel, sometimes it can be civilians caught in a crossfire, but X number of people have to die in order for this particular conflict to count as a war or an armed conflict. The problem is, when we're talking about trends over time, is that there have been dramatic improvements in military medicine. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about this if you'd like, um, that mean that essentially what, what has happened is that we have shifted war casualties from the fatal column to the non-fatal column. So wars have become less lethal, but that doesn't mean that they've become less frequent. Mm -hmm. So could you elaborate a little bit more on that last point you mentioned? Sure. Um, so, so I would say that there have been a series of changes when it comes to military medicine um, that have really changed the, the array of casualties, shall we say, um, that we see as a result of war. Um, and here I'm talking for the most part about 
military casualties, although some of these I think also apply to civilian populations. So one really important change is a ch changes in preventive medicine. So for example, um, the, you know, the rate of death from disease in war far exceeded the rate of death from wounds in war for centuries, for a very, very long time, really until the late, you know, mid-late 20th century. Uh, and that was partly because we didn't know about the germ theory of disease. Um, and so when you read, uh, so I, I'm writing a book right now actually on military medicine in the United States context, and it's really remarkable when you read about um, the United States Civil War from 1861 to 1865, the rate of disease is just horrific. Um, and there's really, you know, the ways that doctors figure out how to prevent disease are almost by accident. They discover that patients who are recovering in the in the fresh air do better than patients who are in uh, closed rooms with closed windows because and they don't understand um, that how disease spreads uh, and you know there's small tax vaccination but that's it at that time uh, and there's there's quinine for malaria but again you know even that is they're, they're still kind of working out how it works and then when you get to World War one, uh, for, for example, and again here mostly focusing on, on the U.S. forces, on the American Expeditionary Force, there's a much better understanding of sanitation, for example, that you have to build latrines or dig latrines a certain distance from camp in order to prevent um, outbreaks of various gastrointestinal illnesses. Uh, there's even, you know, in World War I, you have the, um, the night, it, it coincides, and, you know, arguably well, exacerbates, maybe even causes the 1918 um, flu pandemic. Um, and even there, there is an understanding that we should try and keep people separate if we can, because we do understand that this is, you know, that there's person to person transmission here, but it's just that the circumstances of the war make it very difficult to do that. And measles were a really big issue also in World War One because there were no measles vaccines. Then you move to World War Two and you see much more in the way of preventive medicine. Um, I'll, I'll let me move on to the next piece, which is um, uh, battlefield medicine. Uh, so you know you didn't have. Uh, antiseptics or antibiotics or, or even really good anesthesia in the 19th century, whereas today, um, you know, because you have uh, antiseptics, it's mu you're much less likely to carry a disease from one patient to another because you have antibiotics. Somebody recovering from surgery is much less likely to su succumb to an, uh, to an infection because you have better anesthetics. Doctors have more time to perform surgery uh, pr uh, effectively. Um, and then a, a third factor uh, that has improved military medicine is evacuation, uh, medical evacuation. So in the Civil War, again, and, you know, just in the 19th century more generally, if you were injured, you could be laying on the field for a very, very long time. And if you were lucky enough to still be alive when somebody came to recover you, then you were being evacuated um, by litter, by, by a stretcher, and then maybe on a horse-drawn carriage and maybe eventually a train. Uh, today, um, U.S. forces, uh, or more recently, rather, I should say, U.S. forces in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, you know, were able to ha have very reliable medevac air evacuation. So, uh, you know, there's a, um, there's a principle out there in military medicine, I think in trauma medicine more generally called the golden hour, um, where it's this idea that if you receive higher level medical care within an hour of injury, then you're much more likely to survive. And in Afghanistan, for example, um, U.S. forces wouldn't deploy beyond a perimeter where they could be evacuated within that golden hour, where, where they could get a, hel a medical, medical helicopter to them and evacuate them to a higher level um, medical facility. And then the fourth factor is personal protective equipment. Um, so in uh, which, you know, in the context of COVID-19, we all think about, you know, you know <laughs> with respect to masks, but in the context of war, of course, it looks quite different. So, um, you know, in, in, in the Civil War, um, people were basically wearing what you and I are wearing when it comes, as, as far as 
protection from any kinds of weaponry. Of course, in medieval times, you had you know, that very heavy armor, but uh, once you had the gun gunpowder revolution, that armor, the trade-off between the limited mobility of the armor and the protection just kind of really went in a different direction because it didn't protect. Um, but you move from a situation in the Civil War where you have zero protection to World War I where you have helmets to today where you have body armor. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, the two parts of your body that are most vulnerable to a fatal injury are your trunk and your head. And these parts are protected today. This is part of the reason why you see so many extremity injuries uh, in wars today. I mean, extremity injuries are always common, but people used to bleed out from them. And now we also have much better hemostatics uh, procedures to, to stem blood loss uh, than in the past. So anyway, so all of this, um, as you can see, this is something I'm thinking a lot about these days. So all of this combined um, means that you really do see this dramatic shift in the wound, what's called the, the wounded to killed ratio, which is exactly what it sounds like. Historically, the wounded to killed ratio is very stable at three to one. So for every person killed, you would have three people wounded. Today, depending on who you talk to, again, at least in the U.S. context, the wounded to killed ratio is somewhere between 10 to 1 and 17 to 1. So that means that um, as a percentage of those deployed, many more people are surviving war wounds than they would have in the past. And so you really do see the shift in casualties um, from the fatal column to the non-fatal column, and that I think has real implications for how we should think about trends in war. I think it also has implications on the front end for how we should think about the costs of war mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case, don't you think that people like Steven Pinker and others, when they propose the, the decline of war thesis and they defend it, that they, they are perhaps focusing a little bit too much on death tolls and not other sorts of social costs of war, even things that happen uh, sometimes long before the war is over. Yes, I do. Um, and I think that, you know, in some ways that focus is understandable because death is binary, right? It's, you know, it's a one or a zero. You can, it's, but, you know, there are a lot of debates about what counts as a wound, do um, psychiatric illness, does PTSD uh, mm -hmm. count as a war injury, for example. So that's a lot harder to catalog, but, I do think that by moving the light away from these non-fatal casualties, we absolutely undercount the longer term costs of war. Um, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, given this shift in medicine and military medicine, as a percentage of those deployed, you have many more people coming home from war having survived wounds that they would not have survived in the past. And they are bearing those costs of war upon their person. Their families are bearing significant costs of war as well. Uh, and usually, because most governments have disability systems in place for veterans and lots of benefit systems in place for veterans. The government is bearing these costs of war too. But what's interesting is that when you look at um, forecasts of costs of war on the front end, they almost always frame the human costs of war in terms of fatalities and the financial costs of war in terms of war material, how much does it cost to get a fighter jet in the air? And they don't think about the long tail of the cost of war, which as you say, has always been an issue, um, but I think is uh, really exaggerated and exacerbated today by um, these improvements in military medicine, which I'm not saying you should roll back. I, I'm just saying that, um, you know, if we think about going to war as a cost benefit calculation, then we need to get the cost right. And I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. But even when it comes just to the number of wars, I mean, Thanks. is it really the case that war has been declining in terms of number of wars initiated? Uh, or is it just that perhaps uh, also influenced by international humanitarian law and some of the incentives people get from it, some... 
wars have been framed in different ways than before or classified in different ways? Yeah, I'm skeptical about the claim um, that war is on the decline. I think, you know, it'd be very hard for the reasons I outlined to generate, and it's just hard to find this data, um, to, to generate equivalent numbers that we have now on war fatalities for war wounds. But I think that the, the decline of war thesis for interstate war is overstated by at least half. Um, and I, th I agree that, but I mean, I'm, I'm less, in, in terms of the data sets that we have out there that people like Pinker are relying on, they're not really using these legal criteria like is there is, is there a declaration of war to as a foundation for um, generating these data sets for them? I mean, there are exceptions here and there, but really they're looking at the numbers of, of battle deaths. Um, I mean, they're also, they have other criteria as well, like is the war between states, and so it has to be you know, part of the state system, things like that. But I think that that's really the biggest issue. Um, and it, But I do think that in general, we, because we undercount some of the, the costs of war and we just kind of dismiss them, um, it's very easy to call something uh, not a war uh, when it's, it, it seems a lot like a war to the people who are in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that international humanitarian law has been focusing enough recently or nowadays in issues like on issues like cyber armed conflict and lethal autonomous weapon systems or the so-called killer robots i think that there are you know the same people that we were talking about earlier um, with respect to who the framers of international law are international humanitarian law are they are spending a lot of time thinking about these issues and i mean that comes through almost really in the way that you framed the question um, do you want to call it killer robots or do you want to call it lethal autonomous weapon systems or do you want to call it some, you know there's a real debate about that and that that terminology and those different uh, phrasings come from the international legal community so i do think that they're spending a lot of time thinking about it i think as i said before it's a really challenging set of questions precisely because the technology I mean, it's, it's different from the way that these issues were dealt with in the past in that they're looking ahead instead of looking backward, right? So it's not fighting the last war, it's fighting the next war. Uh, and I think that that is good. But I also think that that makes it challenging for two reasons. One is that we don't know what the technology is going to look like. And two is that we know it's going to change. And so a lot of what's been going on is trying to come to agreement on basic principles. Uh, and then, you know, even if you, even if you do that, though, I think there are going to be lots of issues about applications of those principles. Um, but I do think that they are spending a fair amount of time thinking about those issues now. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to peace treaties, uh, the evidence suggests that they are more helpful to an enduring peace in interstate as opposed to civil wars. So. Do we know why and what can we do to change these trends? I think that that trend is more of a symptom than a cause in the sense that um, it's really hard to get to durable peace in civil wars because when you have a peace treaty between states, each military can retreat behind an international border, on either side of an international border. But when you are trying to resolve a civil war, um, unless it's a secessionist war where one part just leaves the country, um, for a, a non-secessionist civil war in particular, the parties have to live together afterward. And they have to be able to, you know, one, they have to be able to either form a combined army or one side has to give up its weapons or lots of issues around trust. And so I think that the, the fact that peace treaties are correlated with lower, smaller spells or shorter spells of peace and civil war as compared to interstate war, as a, again, is really, it's a symptom, it's, it's sort of an indicator of a, the underlying challenge of um, generating durable peace in civil wars as opposed to interstate wars. It's hard, of course, in both cases, but I think it's harder in the context of civil wars. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, 
So one last question. Uh, are laws of war codified with the intention of disincentivizing war or even trying to eliminate it? So I would say that the framers of international humanitarian law are um, a very, very heterogeneous group, right? They're not all coming to the table with the same set of incentives. I do think that for some, they would like to make going to war, conducting war so challenging that it's just not worth doing mm -hmm. to begin mm -hmm. with. But I think that others take a more pragmatic approach. Um, and while they might want to eliminate war in an ideal world, recognizing that war does happen, the goal, their goal is to limit its worst effects. And I would put myself in that camp. Mm -hmm. But but in that case, I mean, it's just because they're trying to be realistic about it and they do not really think or believe that uh, we will ever have a situation where war simply, uh, I mean, get, uh, gets out of the picture. It no longer has any sort of, uh, I mean, th that war is effectively eliminated. Yeah, I would like to be wrong about that very much, but I don't think that we're going to get to that point. I used to, um, this is a, departing a little bit from what we've been talking about, but I used to say that the only way that we would see an end to war would be if there was an alien invasion. <laughs> but um, given the lack of cooperation that we've seen globally around the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm not so sure about that either. <laughs> um, anymore, I worry. I think that some of us might side with the aliens. Um, so, um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm just not optimistic about, I, I, as I said, I would be very happy to be wrong. Um, there are lots of things I'd be very happy to be wrong about, and this is one of those things, but I don't, I don't think that we're going to see the elimination of war. By the way, since you mentioned that this probably falls outside of your field of expertise, but do you have any opinion in terms of if war is just part of human nature or? I don't. Um, yeah, as you say, it does fall out of my expertise. <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, I'm a political scientist, so I think of war as more of a political problem. Um, if you got, if you talk to a psychologist like uh, like Steven Pinker, um, who seems to think that maybe human nature is changing, I mean, the the why for him, the why of the decline of war is, I think, a little bit murky in his book. Um, he's more making the empirical case, which and, and I I would challenge him and have challenged him on that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not. I, I I wouldn't say one way or the other about whether war is endemic to human nature. Yeah, well, in that case, I think I would trust the anthropologists more, but that's just me. So. Well, the anthropologists have pushed back against Pinker as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I had some of them on the show. So, uh, Okay, so the book is again, Wars of Law and Intended Consequences in the Regulation of Armed Conflict. Uh, Dr. Fazal, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find you and your work? Um, I guess the two places are, well, I have a website, it's just very easy to find, www.tanishafazal.com, I think. Um, and uh, I'm also on Twitter, and again, a very easy handle, just at Tanisha Fazal. Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month, so it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkwi, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, 
Simon Colombo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saim Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC, My Producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Ruzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.